Uh, today, uh, we will be focusing on the topic accelerating drug discovery, the way forward. And uh, the topic will be handled by an expert uh, in this area, uh, Professor Shailaja Singh uh, from JNU. Uh, before I introduce you, uh, let us uh, do a little bit of survey on understanding uh, the participants. As you already know, our sessions always goes with uh, menti.com. So you can go to a browser uh, where uh, you can type in menti.com and you can give the code uh, 559953. As you see on the screen, you can go to a browser with the address menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And uh, you can give the uh, code 559953. Now the purpose of this interface is you can ask questions throughout your uh, her presentation and uh, all the questions will be anonymous and the questions will be taken care of during q and a session so it's not necessary that you have to remember everything at the end of the slides so as her presentation goes on you can ask questions so when you go to this page on every page at the bottom there will be a button to ask question so you can press that and you can ask any questions any any questions um, so of course related to the subject that is very important today's subject uh, as per her uh, presentations moves along so moving forward um, so uh, just uh, uh, for a notification for everybody uh, the people who have joined uh, via me uh, kindly switch off your webcam for better buffering other than the speaker speaker will be having her webcam on when she's going to present uh, you will be in mute mode so you could uh, raise your hand or you can engage in the discussions at the end if you want to unmute and uh, but when you are engaging in the discussion kindly tell your name uh, before engaging a uh, discussion via audio but any other discussions that you're doing through menti it will be anonymous uh, general questions can be shared and any other related questions through text you can ask via menti and uh, we will be more focusing on understanding oh i can see a few people already did that uh, so just to understand uh, what are uh, which is your field uh, that you are uh, either doing research or studying uh, it would be great that you can uh, go to uh, many uh, i can see many people are doing that uh, great uh, so you can click on it and if you scroll down you can go to submit button so i can see there is more of uh, uh, okay a balance of um, biotech biochemistry microbiology as well as uh, others into uh, bioinformatics and uh, mo mo molecular modelers. Yeah, I'll wait for two more seconds. If someone else wants to add more uh, their area. I can see there's already someone has submitted their first question anyway. Okay, so uh, this is uh, um, uh, this is what the audience that we are having. Uh, so we have a mix of around the biotech, biochemistry, microbiology, and molecular biology, and also uh, molecular modeling people. Of course, I can understand uh, where you have drug discovery. So both of them are coming along, and we have a few audience from pharmacology as well as medicinal chemistry, including bioinformatics and computational biology. So we have a good diverse set and uh, equal amount in. Uh, the life sciences and uh, molecular modeling. Thank you so much for that. Uh, moving forward, uh, this also to understand that uh, to rate your confidence on understanding uh, what is your uh, level of understanding or what kind of area you're working on uh, in the area of cell signaling, uh, malaria research, drug discovery on wet lab, uh, cell biology, and DNA repair. So if the participants could, uh, you can drag uh, from ranging from one to five, so five means you're more confident, you're very expert. One or zero means uh, you are yet to learn, so you're in the learning process. And uh, you can drag down and then submit it. Okay, so this is just to understand so that the speaker will have a understanding about the audience. I'll wait for two more seconds. If someone else wants to add in. Okay. Yeah, I, I can see uh, there are uh, some of a uh, few of them already being expert in drug discovery wet lab and in the others, it's more of uh, a balance. So I, I hope uh, 
uh, uh, Professor Shailaja will be able to help us to understand a little bit on her core area uh, on uh, signaling biology. So just to give an overview, uh, today we will be discussing about uh, the topics that we already shown in the previous slides, including more uh, from Professor Shailaja. And we all should refer to open resources uh, and open source references and no uh, promotions of paid products entertained. Uh, all the opinions and discussions are personal view with no connection or relation to the current employees or corporates or any other individual. So uh, this is very important. So now uh, I am going to my, my slide to just introduce her. Uh, so today uh, it will be uh, uh, Professor Kaila Jahuzia. Um, she's an associate professor and head for the signaling biology, uh, special center of molecular medicine um, um, from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. And uh, uh, this is a website that is signalingbiology.org. So I would recommend to go through her uh, research area. So uh, she has been working on malaria and uh, cell signaling and much more. And of course, we are eagerly waiting for her talk and a lot of publications, patents, and many more. So I am very much uh, uh, honored uh, to introduce her and also uh, feel lucky that she has agreed to uh, give a session uh, today on uh, accelerating drug discovery. So over to you, uh, ma'am, and uh, you can present your screen now and uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, Giri. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. And uh, my slides are visible now, uh, my PowerPoint slides. Uh, you, you have to share, madam. Uh, I shared already, so Just, let me check. Ah, yeah, yes. It's okay. So yes. I'm in yes. slide show mode. Yes. So to start with uh, today's topic, as I already uh, you have given a background, very nice that uh, drug discovery. I would like to uh, tell to all the audience that uh, last twenty years. I've, I've involved in the drug discovery, whether it's for the anti-cancer uh, drugs or the anti-malarial, anti-parasitic. And over this uh, last 15 years, what I have learned is that the drug discovery is really a very, very complex process. Uh, in terms of the time timeline, like uh, we start with the basic research, target identification, as well as the uh, uh, we identify some novel molecule, novel targets, and then matching them uh, to to have a better combination. Then, uh, of course, all the talk studies and as well as the finally finding out the uh, the drug. And that too, the still the clinical trials are uh, yet to be done. So it's a real, real long process. But at the same time, what I I feel personally is the uh, the key for any drug discovery is the uh, um, the uh, proper understanding of the disease and finding out the unique target in terms of uh, what you want to target to however if you go to the history you will come to know that uh, in comparison to target based drug discovery phenotypic drug discovery again i am going to uh, explain what is phenotypic drug discovery in detail uh, that has given us more drug in comparison to target-based drug discovery. So again, uh, just to show that is uh, displayed in my slide is the drug discovery cycle. So as you uh, all are aware that anybody, um, any chemist or any researcher or any uh, pharma company, they have the compound collections and those compound collections, which can, could be the novel ones, which could be uh, coming from the natural source or the very, very new chemical uh, identity of those compounds. And whatever the collection is, if those collection can be tested for any high throughput way for any uh, uh, enzymatic assay, protein assay, or any disease models. So that is our primary asset to find out whether these have any capability to, to, to target to any protein, any enzyme, any receptor interactions, any pathway, pathway hub, or whatever it is. So that way the screening, the primary assays like multiples have already been designed and we are also doing so. We want to come up with the new assays that too in a very 
high throughput manner though uh, using the high advanced technological um, interface for example the high content imaging processes high uh, uh, at the level of single cell uh, level or at the single cell molecule level if we want to screen the compounds again any type of function that platforms are available so with those compound collection we go for the primary assays in a high throughput way and that gives us again some bunch of compounds from those ones to go for the secondary assays for example why again as the secondary assays because from the selected ones we would like to know now that whether they are uh, good uh, good in terms of the medicinal property medicinal chemist property they follow all the lipinski rules or they are bioavailable they are uh, they are there in the blood plasma for longer time their uh, half life and uh, their toxicity metabolism as well as the counter screen what i say the counter screen meaning for example if i am looking for a certain sex of compound for a particular target let's say if it is a kinase kinase again a class of kinase i would always like to know whether this compound which is targeting a class or a family of kinase is it also targeting another class or another family of the uh, compounds or not so in that way the secondary screen also helps us to go more specific and after that once we are done with that of course at the level of compounds we also go for some uh, little bit more uh, 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 modification of those compound to be again more stringent and also again to be more specific so that is again the medicinal chemist point of view we would like to add some um, uh, some uh, side chains or something to to um, be, uh, to make it more bioavailable or less toxic or more stringent and with that indirect way or or, or direct way in terms of like com computational approach if our compounds are docking to our target or some wet lab experiment which again i am going to tell you ki how we as a researcher prove that if what is coming from the computer that the target and the compounds are interacting at the level of experiment how we can prove it and there are again thousands of assays for that available and we also then try to be stringent that yes this compound with that protein is interacting together finally with all this exercise we come with the final design that is a compound and that compound may be with the structural activity relation with some different uh, analogs of it and then we also would like to uh, do some simple synthesis ways for example any drug cannot come from the complex synthesis way from the chemist point of view so that that team also look for that yes this compound whether it is now been extracted from any plant or it's a part of any library or any synthesis but if it is entering to the drug regimen if it is uh, entering to the drug field we really want to uh, establish the simpler way of uh, making the, those compounds simpler way of purifying those compounds as well as the cheaper way of making those compounds that is again is not part of my talk so then again we are ready with those things then it goes to the uh, phase 1 uh, clinical trial are called preclinical studies so with this drug discovery cycle you can understand that of course it is a very time taking each point as well as the all uh, that it has a multi components way biology chemi chemistry the medicinal chemistry part and the computational part involved into it but then comes the phase 1 phase 2 and phase 3 clinical trials then it goes to the real patient so in that case like uh, again to be very simpler uh, uh, to to establish some simple uh, understanding i would like to say that any drug discovery like as in my first uh, slide i talked about that any type of drug, uh, drug discovery if you can just simply make it in a two a component that is the phenotypic based drug discovery and the target based drug discovery for example if you have a set of compound right and those sets of compound you now want to test them for any biological inhibition biological uh, uh, processes for example you can look for the cell uh, proliferation in case of cancer you would like to know whether uh, these compounds are blocking your cell proliferation you can also go for the cell death again if i say cell death there are 
10 ways of cell death. We all know the apoptosis, autophagy, autophagy coupled apoptosis, uh, and our case then the receptor independent and our case receptor dependent on and i case apoptosis also have two ways so these are the ways of cell death again you would you would be having that background from your biological understanding okay if at all this kind of a cancer cells they are more uh, more uh, vulnerable towards this kind of a death process you can screen your compounds for those kind of a death process so these all comes under phenotypic based drug discovery so you are saying that uh, maybe this uh, chunk of compound I want to test for the proliferation. Again, for proliferation, what kind of a proliferation? For example, you want to see its effect on the doubling time, or you would like to see even in the proliferation, there are phases, right? Like um, cell undergoes from G1 to S, G2, M, again goes to that. And all pathogens mostly follow this kind of a different process in case of bacteria, lag phase, log phase, and the stationary phase. Whatever the biological target you have, according to that, you are going to screen all sets of your compound in that particular assay. And then you are going to come up with some set of uh, compound that, okay, they are anti that pathogen, anti that cell proliferation or anti uh, or pro apoptotic, pro death mechanism is induced, whatever. So that is coming through the phenotypic drug discovery. So this is a very simpler way. And if you go back and look at the history, whatever drug has come, Generally, the, the, uh, this is not a preferred way, but it is uh, whatever the, uh, the technique which is feeding the, uh, the pharma industry with the new compounds are coming from the phenotypic based drug discovery. Again, you can question, so in that phenotypic drug discovery, we don't know what it is targeting to. And maybe because I'm so blind, I'm only testing for that particular cell phenotype, maybe in a, another case, another pathogen, it might target to another way. So in that case, um, of course, you need um, uh, the, the counter screen has to be very, very correct, where you are going to take um, may, maybe the panel of cells, which are coming from the human body, human physiology, and then you are going to test whether those, those compounds which you have tested for a let's say anti-polyphating in nature for a cancer cells now they are not hitting any of the uh, the normal cell function so those are and again your uh, assays have been designed in a sem similar way taking the normal cell cancerous cells or the pathogens like in my case malaria leishmania whatever or it is if it this pathogen is inside the uh, the host like for example uh, hepatocyte if the parasite is growing inside the hepatocyte i need to see what is the growth rate of the parasite inside the hepatocyte if it is growing uh, let's say one parasite in the epithelial lining epithelial cell like in case of covid uh, virus it is uh, uh, inside the uh, the uh, the lung um, lung cells and inside the lung cells what it is doing whether the proliferation any of your compound is blocking the replication of the, that particular virus so these all comes under the phenotypic uh, based drug discovery now the question is the limitation as i said the phenotypic uh, based drug discovery limitation is that you don't know the target about it so your work again uh, goes to identify the target and if you really want to identify the target again it's a research for more than five to six years because you really want to pinpoint uh, out of trillions of uh, molecules or thousands of proteins inside your uh, cell you would like to know which it is going to target to, which it is going to bind to, which is the protein it is maximally binding to or inhibiting the function in what way. So this, but it gives you something in that. But the second way, which I say that uh, that is a target-based drug discovery where uh, you know from your research, you know what is the key protein, what is the key of my cell. For example, if I know, uh, any DNA replicating enzyme, the enzyme is responsible for the DNA replication. I'm targeting this one. So of course, the replication process is going to be stopped and that way it is. It's just a very simple example, but in a complex pathogen, we would like to also know, like for example, in case of malaria, I would like to know what are the 
proteins involved in case of malaria parasite which is helping the parasite to go inside the red cell which what it is uh, what what are the sets of protein helping parasite to encourage of the host cell what are the sets of protein after entering of entry of the parasite to the host cell is involved in the biological function of the parasite for example maybe some stress related protein because they have to under that harsh situation inside the host cell they have to maintain their protein integrity they need to uh, turn on the transcription they need to turn on the uh, translation so maybe these ones can be the good target so in that case if i know from my research and every researcher they are coming up with the new target every day like for example in my research i have identified more than 35 targets from malaria parasite which uh, can be targeted targeted or drug drugged through the small molecule and we can block the parasite interaction to the host or the parasite survival inside the host or the parasite proliferation inside the host or the parasite transmission from the host to the another host so these can be the different biological process anybody can uh, target to and then your identification of one protein or the sets of protein or the pathway or the any uh, hub proteins i should say which are regulating this processes that they can serve as the target so once you have the target you again bring back to the platform and say this is the target now i want to compound against these targets and then with that compound and your target first starts with the the assay development so again the assay development could be in vitro you make the protein you have the compound just do it then you will know that okay compounds are interacting to the protein which you have made again it's a totally in vitro system then you are going to go to the more uh, stringent way inside the cell whether your compounds are targeting this particular protein which you think is a target so you need to prove that on target effect you have to exclude the off target effect when i say off target inside the cell again it becomes very very tough and become very complex because you know you, uh, you have proposed that that particular protein is been targeted by x compound let's say so you are going to maybe some technique molecular biology technique or some screening techniques you are going to fetch out okay um, that my compound is targeting to this particular protein is fine because you have predicted you have done the in, in vitro experiment but at the same time out of thousands of protein you have to also prove that your compounds are not targeting to another one that we call the off target uh, exclusion meaning we need to really show that that the pro, uh, that the compound which we have uh, screened or we have uh, come up from our in vitro high throughput assays they are very specific inside the cell to a particular uh, particular protein not to the another one so you can go proteomics uh, like a global proteomics based experiment cellular thermal shift assays coupled with proteomics comparative proteomics so many ways and again it's again a area where you can go and reprove that is your target validation as well as the uh, the confirmation of hit and the target uh, complexity and then finally with that you have come up with the compound and then starts with the toxicity assay with the other things and then finally uh, going to the preclinical studies then the phase one phase two phase three and then finally the drug so uh, you can uh, think of so many uh, complexities are involved whether it's a phenotypic based drug discovery or the target based drug discovery the steps and the stringency as well as the toxicity safety then going for the um, approvals and then finally of course that compound the chemistry aspect which i am not touching is also involved in it however a fast track method nowadays we all talk about the fast track and very very uh, uh handy uh, method i should say is a uh, drug repositioning so uh, again what is drug repositioning so you can think of as if a compound which you know let's say in my case it, it is known for diarrhea a very simple uh, compound over the counter drug you can just go uh, because when i say drug repositioning now i 
cannot say it's a compound it is a drug already either drug already present in the market or maybe the the, the sets of drug which are somehow have some problem and they are excluded uh, at present from from the market or from the uh, treatment procedure and maybe they are waiting to go to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the real uh, drug uh, pipeline and those compounds also can come for the drug repositioning uh, purpose so in that case let's say uh, one compound has come up with the x disease but somehow in the x disease that doses required to treat for that x disease is too high for that particular drug and then there is a some issue for the fda approval or some issue with the toxicity maybe uh, some particular cell is getting affected and that sets of compounds are lying because we cannot go for further for uh, that particular drug with those particular disease so in that case you would like to maybe take that drug because that has already uh, completed some cycle of drug discovery but of course for that disease it's not uh, uh, not good enough so you would like to reposition it for a ex, uh, maybe for y disease so that re drug repositioning uh, method is quite important because already your uh, your uh, platform has already been uh, meaning timeline has been very shortened so it's a fast track method so in drug repositioning also there are two three ways right in drug repositioning you can again go for phenotypic meaning you know the drug and just test it for any type of phenotype which you would like to know but uh, you you uh, don't know the target for example we we know artemisinin it's a well known drug for first time identified for, for malaria then it go, went on for viruses went on for cancer went on for uh, helminthes like whatever you will name the artemisinin you will find some of the uh, application towards other disease but if i uh, ask you what is the target of this artemisinin still we don't know after almost uh, this compound has already um, due to this compound already the nobel prize has come but we don't know the target inside the cell inside malaria this particular compound is targeting to which protein no we can't say there are thousands of new uh, cutting edge techniques and all we can say okay it is targeting x y z a b c d but which one is the real right one and this is the only one we we don't know so in that case when it has been reproposed or repositioned or repurposed for any other disease we don't know the target but we know okay it is effective against cancer and you will find again hundreds of uh, publication where artemisinin has been used for breast cancer for oral cancer for uh, colon cancer for many type of cancers so in that case again it's a re drug repurposing without any target so i will call it as a phenotypic drug repositioning but at the same time then comes that why can't you reposition the drug on the basis of uh, target so for example many of the drugs we know the target they may be they are uh, they are uh, Mm, targeting to a particular enzyme let's say um, take any enzyme uh, phosphodiesterase which uh, we know that uh, it's involved in the cyclic amp uh, degradation so pde inhibitors are unknown and this phosphodiesterases are there not only in pathogen but it are there in the cancer they are also there in the many cell types many pathogens so if at all they are there that drug already known to block that particular pde but that pde is also present in another pathogen so now i am repositioning that particular drug with the known target for the known target but now the the cell type is different because maybe i am repositioning uh, the drug uh, for the let's say uh, malaria coming from cancer 
because malaria parasite also has the phosphodiesterase. I would like to block the phosphodiesterase to block the cyclic AMP signaling and to block the malaria proliferation. But they are already known drug which is there for anti-cancer agent because they block the phosphodiesterase and the same signaling uh, cascade in the cancer cells. So that way, this is uh, the target base. So if you see here, the repositioning approach, which is again a fast track approach, no, uh, no need to reiterate. So you can see uh, for the repositioning approach, there is a disease centric approach, target centric approach and the drug centric approach. So for example, disease centric approach, I know that particular drug is, let's say in my case, I know that X, uh, the, uh, the, uh, we, we are trying to reposition a drug from the, um, that uh, a UTI uh, um, and then that particular UTI drug is now showing us anti-malaria. So for a particular disease, we are targeting to malaria pathogen. So the treatment uh, we know, uh, maybe we don't know the target even in that case, the, in case of UTI, but then we have a new indication. So from one indication, let's say I have a drug, which is again, uh, very over the counter drug, it targets the um, UTI and uh, it is used for the uh, UTI and that indication is there that this drug is uh, against UTI, but I am taking another indication that no, no, it is also anti-malarial. So that is disease centric. From one disease, I am repositioning to another disease. The same time, the, uh, there could be a target, target centric. So the target centric, I know the drug. Drug is targeting uh, one particular uh, protein or the enzyme. And that enzyme, as just now I discussed, is present in maybe uh, leishmania and also maybe malaria. And this drug is anti-leishmanial and the same uh, target is present in malaria. So of course it could be anti-malaria. So again, drug coming to the target and then the target indication is there for the, both the disease. So two indication. So that is a target centric because we, we have the information about the target, the protein which is involved in that particular function. Then the drug centric. For example, there are also a class of drug positioning uh, where I am saying that there is a drug. It can target X protein in one disease, but it can also target X2 protein in Y disease. That means even I am changing now the target. So let's say a drug known for phosphodiesterase 1 inhibitor, but phosphodiesterase 1 that drug is blocking the phosphodiesterase 1, but it doesn't mean it is not blocking phosphodiesterase 2 because it has maybe some off-targeting effect. So that off-targeting effect can be exploited because maybe in another type of disease, this phosphodiesterase 2 is overexpressed and I need the same drug, which I know from the X study that it is targeting the phosphodiesterase 1, but it has a capability because it cannot distinguish between the uh, phosphodiesterase 1 to 2. So it might be targeting the 2 also. Let me reposition it for the for the another disease. So then one drug has a 2 target and that 2 targets have 2 different indications, meaning 2 different disease. So that way that repositioning can be classified. Uh, am I audible to all? Because I'm not getting any questions. Uh, yes, madam, you're audible. As I told you, your questions will be only uh, visible at the end. Yep. Okay. So yeah. uh, with that, uh, like, for example, uh, just I would like to present some case studies, uh, like uh, um, that um, uh, after talking to the repositioning, uh, what we are doing. So, for example, what in a very recent work, what we have done, we have uh, repositioned the anti-hepatitis C uh, virus drug that is Elisporivir against the artemisinin resistant plasmodium. So in that case, uh, C. Uh, the, this I will cat, uh, categorize, this work I will categorize in a target-based repositioning. Why? Because in case of Elisporivir, we know that it is against anti-HCV 
first of all we know the disease and we also know it targets the cyclophilin so that drug targets the cyclophilin in the virus now my question is ki uh, if this drug drug elisporivir can be repositioned for malaria the malaria parasite whether first question is, is there any cyclophilin yes there is a cyclophilin and if there there is a cyclophilin that cyclophilin has a similar function what is reported in the hepatitis c virus so again we have to check and the more basic research point of view and we know that yes it is there for the similar scaffolding function so that also gave us the clue that yes this can be repositions on a target based repositioning approach for the malaria but then i am coming up okay we also try to reposition it for a more dangerous form of malaria parasite that is a artemisinin resistant uh, malaria parasite so why artemisinin because uh, we all are aware that uh, the only drug for malaria is the artemisinin based chemotherapy and in that artemisinin based chemotherapy uh, drug that uh, the asians mostly the asia pacific regions are we are coming up with the new new uh, resistance Uh, so the the malaria parasite especially the plasmodium falciparum they are becoming resistant to this artemisinin and we are not ready with the second set of compound because this is the only drug being used and out of lot lot many years of research so uh, we would really want to target the artemisinin resistant malaria parasite in a different way so uh, what could be the possibility so very interestingly uh, this compound uh, elisporvir which again i said it targets the cyclophilin and in malaria parasite which are resistant to artemisinin this particular protein is overexpressed again we got the second clue okay not only for anti malaria reaction but in a artemisinin resistant parasite this particular protein which is a target for elisporvir is up regulated so can i really test it and that's what now i am going to show the result i am not going to tell you in detail so here when you can see in the one a figure where you can um, uh, first we just tested whether it's anti malarial or not so this compound elisporvir which is represented by alv it was very nice anti malarial again the uh, the ic50 was 268 uh, nanomolar and uh, we also compared with the known compound that is cyclosporin a which has been shown to anti malaria the function was almost the same uh, rather elisporvir was better than the cyclosporin a which is a similar mechanism anti malaria then we tested the same compound that is one b against some resistant line so here we just took normally chloroquine resistant line to just check whether it is a broad spectrum uh, anti malaria meaning for example it is not working through the chloroquine resistance uh, mechanism it is just have a different target and that is also one way to prove that uh, you are targeting a different mechanism and that's what we are again finding that uh, elisporvir is uh, anti malarial even in artemisinin resistant line the next question which is a very again a very um, a regular way of doing phenotypic uh, or the any screening method that we also want to see which stage of malaria parasite being killed by this elisporvir you treat at different different uh, uh, point of uh, cell cycle proliferation of malaria parasite by the compound and you do see okay it's very fast killing because after the 6 uh, to 8 hours of the time period your parasites are almost dead then you also would like to because uh, as i said that this drug is already known uh, this drug is for anti hcv and it's in the phase 3 clinical trial so uh, if it is known but then also we need to test them for some certain toxicity aspect because they have already done that of a red blood cell so we tested that also that is 1d and you can see they are really good they are not uh, uh, at all uh, lysing the red cell 
and then we also uh, did the uh, because the parasite as we know in inside the human it goes for the two cycle uh, two days cycle proliferation because uh, you must be aware that if you get the malaria infection every 48 hours you get the fever if it is a falciparum malaria so we also treated the uh, the culture just to mimic the similar physiological condition for uh, day one day two day three and we could see that it is uh, the elispovir which we are repositioning from hcv to malaria are uh, really showing the same way then we also took this compound to the animal model because uh, we have like a malaria also we can uh, um, uh, we can gr uh, grow the malaria parasite in a mouse model. So in that case, uh, that that parasite is called Plasmodium bergiai, Yoliai, or Chabudai. But in our case, we have taken the Plasmodium bergiai. So that Plasmodium bergiai, it creates malaria, it causes malaria in mouse, and that mouse also gets fever. And once the parasitemia goes more than 40%, mouse dies. So with that kind of a system, we again tested the elispovir, and then we know that elispovir, how it has been taken to the phase three clinical trial, similar way, the dosing we did. So equivalent dosing, for example, what is known for human dosing for HCV, we have calculated the equivalent dosing, and that dose is really clearing the malaria parasite, that is 1E and then also been represented at the level of survival. Our mouse was surviving till the day 50. Otherwise, the controls, they die uh, very uh, early. So as I said, this was just for the repositioning purpose, where one drug from the HCV is repurposed for malaria. But because we wanted to do the target-based repurposing, and the target, because the, for that particular drug, the target is known and the target is cyclophilin. First, I uh, check the, whether the cyclophilin of malaria parasite is there or not. So we, uh, my collaborator, they have already published the work where they could show the cyclophilin in malaria is a very key protein for malaria parasite proliferation and growth. So with that, <clears throat> that has come in nature communication. So we had that information already, but the new information what we added, that the, in the resistant line, as I said, due to the resistance mechanism, there is an upregulation or more expression of the cyclophilin, that is 2A. You can see in the, my resistant, artemisinin resistant line, that is R539T, you have more expression of cyclophilin, and that is also relatively we have shown through the bar graph. And also we have shown through the IFA, immunofluorescence assay, where we have used anti-cyclophilin antibody. And you can see in the, uh, in the resistant line, this, um, there is more expression. And the, the important part is when this protein is overexpressed, and that is leading to the resistance against artemisinin, if I am using this, repurposing this LS4VIR, in the same IC50, I am doing much better. That is our 2E, because that is 4.55 fold decrease in the growth of malaria parasite could be achieved when we are combining it with the artemisinin. So it's just one case study I wanted to show to all of you that, yes, the repurposing which here I'm presenting is a more uh, target-based repurposing where you know the drug, you know the target, but in your case, your disease, you are just repositioning on the basis of target. And then finally, these are some supporting data. And this is a slide where we are showing that the cyclophilin B of malaria parasite, which is already known to interact to cyclosporin A, but it is also interacting more uh, more stringently with cyclophilin B of uh, malaria parasite. So you can see some um, some energy calculation uh, just to, I, I'm not sure this has been done uh, uh, with the collaboration again where we could show that yes, uh, this is. So all about that uh, drug repositioning and these are the target based. 
so now you can think of the enormous amount of opportunity where uh, um, whatever bug you are working on it could be a virus it could be pathogen in my case it is parasite uh, leishmania and malaria and also um, uh, the uh, the interface where how the parasite interact to the host so in that way and uh, i can uh, think of repurposing and if i can repurpose my i can provide a fast track uh, way of uh, drug discovery so uh, just to give another example uh, this is again a very very interesting study so in this case uh, what we have done uh, so that that particular um, hcv drug which i just discussed was uh, very nicely now repositioned for malaria and we are uh, under publication for this uh, work but at the same time uh, we were also uh, looking for the another targets which i have been working on like for example if you are target just think about that here <clears throat> you are saying i have a target which is there in some mammalian cell of course that's why um, um, but you have a homologous protein in case of your pathogen but always there will be a chance of some pathogenicity uh, but you need to look for uh, that particular that particular handle which can give you um, which can give you a specificity against your pathogen maybe your pathogen has the very similar homologous protein but it has some residues or something different which is not there in the mammalian cell counterpart so that makes it more though it's a target based repurposing but it makes it more specific more stringent and more convincing for anti uh, um, for the drug development purpose so um, here uh, we 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 were working on some we were trying to understand some of the uh, anti uh, some of the receptors which are present in the red cell and those, those receptors we wanted to really uh, try to block the malaria parasite again it's a very crazy idea because uh, these receptors are present in the target cells and the target cells are human cells because parasites Uh, are targeting to human cell to enter and to proliferate and we are trying to develop some compound against those target cell but uh, that can lead us the toxicity so in that case we wanted to look for that kind of a protein which are there in the host cell but not useful for the host cell so maybe targeting those protein will not affect the human host not cause any toxicity but it is very important for the parasite so again it's a research area where you are going to identify a target from the host and then if your target is coming from the host that target you know is not at all essential for your host cells but essential for your parasite and if you can block it you can really block the parasite or any pathogen proliferation growth invasion etc now the question is uh, how to identify of course you have to put a lot of uh, uh, attention uh, maybe various different approaches to identify a sets of protein which are there uh, in the host but not being useful by the host but more mostly useful for the parasite so you can understand the host pathogen interaction for the identification of the target present in the host but exploited by the parasite and then you would like to explore that protein for the development of anti malaria or any pathogen in that sense so we also came across uh, very luckily uh, is a nearly a red blood cell antigen so generally the red blood cell antigens they are there but they what kind of function they present some of them are not essential they are there to 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 have a signature but they are not there to do any function one thing second thing this uh, the host uh, targeted therapy or the host targeted uh, drug discovery has many advantage and one of the very very important advantage is it is it is free from resistance 
why i say it is free from resistance because it is present in the host cell parasite has no handle or no control over this protein because this protein is not in in its genome it is there in the host so how come a parasite can change any residue or any uh, any uh, mutation which can change this uh, host protein so of course if you can find one target which is there in the host parasite has no control over it and you have developed one drug it is forever because you will never ever get resistance against that drug so keeping that all in mind we also came up with one drug target that is kelp and first of all we identify it is there in 99% humans because i cannot propose a drug for malaria which are specific to a particular ethnic group or which are specific to a particular country i would like to have the very general thing so in that case this particular antigen blood group antigen is very common 99% per, uh, of humans are this kelp positive and then we check that this antigen and then the compound which is again we are repurposing so this compound Uh, which is a uh, enzyme inhibitor we try to uh, see through the uh, the first the computational interaction and we could see okay it's very nicely targeting this but it's just not uh, enough so we also wanted to uh, to uh, isolate this protein so you you will really like it the single band like uh, we we purified this protein from the human red cell and that protein in vitro showed again uh, inhibition by this compound and then because this is present in the host parasite is using this protein for entry and if we are blocking we are blocking all kinds of malaria because the red cell is the same though the parasites are changing but the red cells are not changing so in that case here i am showing that uh, not only and the 3d7 but other resistant line the efficiency is almost the same as well as that uh, in mouse model because you will also uh, i think many of you know that uh, mouse also uh, mice also have blood groups and they also have this kel antigens so of course the mice mouse malaria is using that kel antigen and we are blocking and we are also blocking the invasion process so again to retreat by various method by enzymatic method and to proving that this is the target the cellular thermal shift assay because if your compound is interacting with your protein it will stabilize the protein and it can stabilize the protein which can be seen by various method it's a simple method is just to see under the gel the sds page gel and at 80 degree that is the down uh, graph you can see that at 80 degree if we are not putting the compound even at 40 degree the protein gets degraded i am not seeing any band but if the compound is there with the protein and even if you put the 80 degree celsius temperature there is a protection so uh, that means they are interacting but we have also proved through the spr by other method and then finally we could show yes this particular protein is involved in the invasion process and then finally involved in the The, the so it's a good news because sometime uh, your research also uh, helps you to find out some novel target and that target is the host host based target and then you uh, you are lucky enough to reposition already present drug to a this particular new target and that new target is giving is now resistance free because it is not under the control of malaria but and in other note i would also like to show some of our data where uh, like uh, uh, the phenotypic screening which i already i am interacting almost uh, 10 uh, different uh, uh, chemist so they have the bigger library their approaches uh, of library formations are very different some people uh, some of the chemists they are using maybe they are they are heterocyclic specific uh, they are making heterocyclic compounds some of them are making natural scaffold 
based compounds. Some of them are using the uh, diversity oriented synthesis to come up with the library. Some of them are uh, making some synthetic compounds which are uh, hybrid ones. So hybrid chemist, uh, chemistry, hybridization chemistry or whatever. So with those compounds, I have uh, I'm collaborating and I, we are just screening against anti-malarial action because we don't know the target uh, for those compounds. So just uh, put the compounds in your malaria parasite culture. You will see whether it's blocking, not blocking. You have the drug resistant parasite. You have drug sensitive parasite. You do the high throughput screening. That is a phenotypic screening. Then you also want to know how it is killing the parasite because parasites also, they are just stuck, they are dead. What kind of a death it is, mitochondrial mediated apoptosis, mitochondrial independent apoptosis, what kind of a death it is. And here is the data we could show. It's more on the, uh, the, the uh, targeting through the mitochondrial um, uh, mediated apoptosis, so we could see. And then apoptosis, like a very simpler in case of cancer and other, we look for the DNA fragmentation that is tunnel assays. So you can see in the, uh, the down uh, panel that the red dot is uh, showing a DNA fragmentation in malaria parasite with this particular natural, uh, uh, natural compound inspired um, uh, drug-like molecule. And then we could see they are also targeting the mitochondrial homeostasis. That is to the JC1 study. Just for the student, everybody, the student, I would like to know that uh, mitochondrial membrane potential um, is also one of the target for many of the compounds. So in that case, uh, how you, uh, what are the, what is the assay to, to, to screen the mitochondria, the compounds against mitochondrial membrane potential. So there is a dye, JC1. So if the mitochondria is intact, so in that, if, if in that case, the dye goes inside the mitochondria and the mitochondrial membrane is intact. So then it retains there only. So, and then it aggregates. So it shows a red color. So in that case, you can see in the left hand side panel in the control, you see very nice red color that itself shows the mitochondria is now intact. Membrane is intact. So the dye is fluorescing red and some of the cytosolic uh, presence of the dye you can see in the green. But if I am, my, I am targeting the parasite or let's say in any cancer cell also, that compound is uh, targeting the mitochondrial membrane potential. So the membrane is now gone. The membrane potential is now gone. So the red color could not be retained into the mitochondria and it will disperse and more cytosolic staining that is in green. So the same dye, when it aggregates, it gives a red color. When it disperses, it gives a green color. So you just measure what is red, how much is the red, how much is the green. And the ratio of the red and green will tell you the intactness or the, the mitochondrial membrane potential. So you can see here red color, but in control, red color is very nicely visible. And then tunnel assay just now I told you that uh, the fragmented DNA can also be probed by using the BRDU staining. So there is a NIC, you will put the BRDU, BRDU will go and incorporate it into the NIC present in the DNA. Anti-BRDU. I think there is an audio problem. Uh, just wait for a few seconds. Sorry for that. We have a screen for and we have published a lot. So I'll keep on like you just um, that these are the coming from phenotypic screening. These are coming from the target based. So one for example for the target based is like, <clears throat> again, from our research, we uh, we uh, we we come up with a target based uh, by target based drug discovery we found a compound that is uh, again a menjoxazine derivative and uh, that is uh, coming from the phytobiophenol so you must be knowing that uh, that clove oil clove contains this um, phytobiophenol and that phytobiophenol we we uh, did some uh, derivatization to make it more drug-like, and that we uh, we 
we uh, somehow uh, from the literature we know, knew the target of this bio phytobiophenol that it targets the uh, the atp pump so uh, in case of malaria parasite also uh, we have this uh, atp pump that is atp4 present in malaria parasite membrane and then we knew that this compound is uh, in in cancer is targeting this so we could reposition uh, this particular compound it's not a drug still it uh, nobody has uh, taken it to the uh, phase 1 phase 2 clinical trial so we could see it is very nicely targeting the pfatp4 and because it is targeting the pfatp4 which is a sodium uh, potassium channel so we could do all the biological uh, again work where we could show that it is anti malarial left panel targeting the uh, death through the mitochondria then the uh, calcium and the so sodium homeostasis because this channel really helps to maintain the sodium inside the cell so that is now disrupted so more sodium is in so that means you are salting in somehow you are killing the parasite by putting more and more salt because you have now the you have a, a flux pump the the pump has been uh, inhibited by this compound so there is no way that parasite can salt out like uh, sodium from the parasite can be flux out to maintain the sodium homeostasis because we have blocked it so uh, that way it's a very nice in, uh, study where we could show that uh, by salting it we are killing the parasite just to uh, to inhibit that homeostasis so uh, um, <clears throat> that way like uh, as i said that lot of work been done and then not only uh, by single compound but we also wanted to use the compound with some of the carrier again it's a matter of uh, like how you are taking for uh, drug discovery you always want it, want to conjugate or maybe you want to make a scaffold where you want to put the drug it should be sustained release it should be that way so we also did some and we conjugated the some of our compound with the graphene oxide some of the compounds with our nanoparticles and we tried to improve and we have published uh, again many papers on that where uh, we have uh, used some natural scaffold to to keep the drug we have also used some nanoparticles to encapsulate the drug and uh, finally we could deliver it more specific to the target site for example even inside the cell you would like to know the destination where do you want to put your compound for the maximum action maybe you would like to put your compound into the mitochondria you would like to put your compound in the er you would like to put your compound in the nucleus or in the cytosol so that specificity can also be generated by using the carrier molecule carrier molecule and that carrier molecule could be anything and uh, in case of cancer cells like you must be knowing that we want to deliver the compound only to the cancer cells not to the normal cells so some of the receptors present more on the cancer cells are being used the receptor uh, as a receptor but the ligands are being used to coating of the shell containing compounds to target uh, but i am uh, talking more advanced version where not only targeting the cell even targeting inside the cell to the very specific location can also be achieved for the drug discovery so again the validation uh, as i told if you are uh, coming from uh, either target based drug discovery or the phenotypic uh, drug discovery ultimately you you have to really pay attention and put lot of efforts to for the target validation how will you do the target validation that it is only targeting this particular protein or enzyme not to the others cell based assays are there in vivo disease models are there then you can also use some tool compounds so i would really like to spend 2 minutes for the tool compounds what is tool compounds to validate your target <clears throat> again we have published some some of the paper in this direction so let's say i have a drug and i am saying this drug is attacking a particular protein so maybe it's an enzyme so that drug and goes and binds to the uh, that Uh, particular enzyme catalytic region and 
I can show it through the many methods. Computational is one, but of course the wet lab. So the drug, I'm pulling the drug, so the protein is coming out. So that way interaction through the surface, surface plasmon resonance method, through the cellular thermal shift assay, you can do thousands of assay to prove it. But at the same time, you also would like to uh, prove it to another tool. And here I would like to spend two minutes. That is a, by, by using the tool compound. So you must all, uh, because I am not a chemist, but uh, the idea behind this was to use the compound the same compound, but the head should be uh, linked with the chiral, chiral way. Meaning you have a compound. Now the, 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 the functional head is some way, uh, um, um, is some way present, presented to the protein in a particular, um, uh, particular three-dimensional way, but in a, another chiral form of the same compound. So the chemical formula is the same, but it is now oriented towards the other way. And if it is not affecting your cell, that means it's not going in fitting into the pocket. So the chemical entity of your compound is not toxic. In a particular orientation only, it is going and binding to the protein target. And then only it is, it is being effective. It's proving you what? It is proving you that, that your compound is very First of all, specific to that particular protein. If it would have not uh, specific to that particular protein, still you would have got some cell death. And also the specificity, there is no off-target effect. And the chemical uh, composition of your compound is not toxic to, to the cell. So this way, but there are other methods also, like you can see the gene expression data to, to look for the target validation, overexpression, meaning you will overexpress your target in, in the cell more. Let's say X enzyme is the target of Y drug. You overexpress the X enzyme, the dose required for Y drug would be more because now the more protein is present. Itself is showing that it is targeting to that particular enzyme. So this is overexpression. Then down expression or the down regulation rnai if you will just eliminate the target you will not see any effect because they the compound how the compound is going to target because there is no uh, no uh, target present so that way you can prove comparative genetics you can prove molecular pharmacology of variants again you can do analysis of molecular signaling pathway how that uh, particular drug is uh, affecting that uh, molecular signaling pathway or the, uh, the signaling hub, you can check interaction study. If your enzyme is interacting to the other protein or protein is interacting to other protein, the protein-protein interaction, cell-based assay, many things can be done. So, and then competition, of course, uh, you can make uh, some uh, analog of your compound and then that analog, uh, which should give you the uh, the competition again proving the same thing that the target and the compounds are matching so this way and that way we, you can validate so the target based drug discovery that is the target validation is being done and then once the target validation is being done you go for the compound screening in a high throughput way then you go for a secondary assays then you go for the all pharmacological assay, disease efficacy, and then finally the candidate is ready for preclinical, then the clinical and uh, so uh, if I go on, uh, uh, Giri, how much time I have? Uh, Madam, it would be great if you can wind up in another five minutes, okay. if possible. So, yeah. uh, yes, so in that case, uh, just uh, very, very uh, quickly, I would like to show my very, very recent work that is a uh, plant-like kinase. Uh, again, we have identified this uh, kinase present in malaria parasite. And because uh, this malaria parasite kinase is a plant-like, it's not there in the human. It's a very specific target. And now if I know the target, of course, as a researcher, I would like to know what are the compounds hitting this target, which is plant-like in nature, present in malaria parasite. So it is very specific and it cannot give a toxicity. And then 
if at all i i i can uh, identify some of the compounds which are drug like against this kinase i want to kill the kinase not only by inhibiting the catalytic pocket but also i would like to block interaction of this kinase to other uh, other um, protein or the kinases because in malaria parasite this kinase was also shown to be involved in the signaling cascade interaction with the other protein so the idea was to block it for the activity but also block it for the interaction so the complete lockdown not only for the activity but also for the interaction and we could do that uh we first uh, here is the the hypothesis which we made that we would like to block the kinase but we also would like to uh, block its interaction so the one of the interacting partner of this kinase was 1433 which is a scaffold protein and which helps the the kinase to be active to be to be present on a particular destination and that interaction it can be blocked can really give us the good anti malaria so we uh, we went for some uh, virtual screening so there is a there are some um, uh, natural compound library present in uh, in sigma sites so we screened 10000 compounds and from 10000 compounds from virtual screening we uh, we took 18 compounds and those 18 compounds wet lab we do, did the uh, surface plasmon resonance uh, experiment and we could come up with the two compounds and those two compounds it's again written here they could show a very nice kinase inhibition very nice anti malarial very nice anti kinase at the autophosphorylation also at the transphosphorylation and these two inhibitor was showing a very nice binding and then uh, the, the 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 idea was and the real good news is that this kinase is a calcium dependent protein kinase so the the calcium activates this kinase but my compound is binding to the kinase even in the presence of calcium or in the absence of calcium so we don't need to wait kinase to be active to work whatever form it is we are going to block it and that's the real good news but it also uh, we confirm this binding through the thermal shift assay and then its interaction to 1433 which is uh, one of the interactor and our compounds are also blocking the interaction that is our uh, last uh, slide here the peptide we could design one and two which are blocking this uh, interaction of cgpk1 with uh, its interacting partner 1433 and not only the interaction with the inhibitor which we have i have shown in earlier slide with that inhibitor if we are combining so we are completely locking down or blocking the activity of cgpk so this that's this and i think uh, i would like to now take the questions whatever uh, students Okay. Um, Was it clear uh, to all of you? <laughs> Absolutely, madam. Uh, by uh, we have uh, got quite number of questions also. So uh, you you you're going to see it on your screen now. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. um uh, thank you so much uh, uh, shailaja madam uh, it was a great uh, overview and in depth analysis on going through your case studies uh, uh, being i was also i was basically a biochemist turned into a computational medicine chemist uh, okay. as you have clearly mentioned about uh, uh, drug repositioning based on target as well as on uh, drug focus uh, now uh, i have bit a uh, little bit uh, curious to know Uh, of course you have talked a lot uh, and have uh, validations on incubation studies but uh, what about uh, pharmacokinetic for example uh, yeah. day before yesterday acs also had a webinar uh, to understand how drugs passes through cell or reaches the cell so uh, there they didn't talk about more of incubation but uh, combining both the webinars it will be wonderful for the, all the attendees I, i would recommend you to please watch that too uh, because both combines together Uh, you have a, a promising compound in your hand which can go sure. for the next step so could you please give your views on uh, uh, why or uh, whether uh, pharmacokinetic like ADME apart from toxicity uh, also to be uh, analyzed for you to have a promising drug like molecule yes so uh, uh, as i said the uh, the repurposing you are doing and if at all let's say uh, 
you are repurposing your drug for one type of cancer to another type of cancer. Maybe it may end the, uh, the other uh, pharmacokinetics would be more or less same, right? Yeah. Because there you don't have to worry much about. But if we are really repurposing a drug, which is let's say for cancer and now I'm repurposing for malaria, first mm -hmm. of all, the dosing would be different. Yes. Second of all, the retention time, because that's what it comes, right? Because for my malaria parasite, the proper exposure for the bioavailability, I don't know. So again, I need to do all that exercise for uh, for repurposing a cancer drug to malaria. But if I'm repurposing a breast cancer drug to maybe some, some kind of, a, let's say, intestinal cancer or some other type of tumors, maybe I would be more comfortable taking some of the parameter which has already been shown to a particular thing okay but, uh, but for the for this of course the all admin and everything has to be released re-established yes okay okay clear so we will uh, go with the questions uh, so the yeah. first question is could you please give some sample case study on phenotype based drug discovery i think dd is for drug discovery yes yeah, so I think phenotypic based drug discovery case study is artemisinin, one of my favorite. <laughs> yes, okay. so uh, the artemisinin, as I told, is already okay. there for more than, uh, I should say, 100 years. Uh, okay. malaria, since malaria is there, and then we don't know uh, the, uh, the target because the first time with you two uh, who identified this compound, uh, yeah. It's just uh, shown anti-malarial, so it's a phenotypic based drug discovery. Okay, so uh, so, uh, so whatever you presented, that would be the best example that they can take it forward. <laughs> yes, yes. I think great. this is the only miracle that drug I always say. Okay, great. Now, uh, uh, good evening. Uh, any yes. research in COVID? At, oh, okay, are you carrying out any research uh, related to COVID-19? Yes. So, you know, uh, uh, I have started uh, looking uh, for uh, anti-COVID compound and why? Because as I said, my focus is only on malaria and leishmania. I, but at the same time, the machinery which malaria and leishmania has, some of the protease, which I think is a target, mm -hmm. it's also there in the virus. Yes. So it, it makes all sense. If I talk about the, uh, the target-based drug discovery, or repositioning, I, I should be really looking towards it. So I have like, I am also part of the Medicines for Malaria Venture. So I have like a collection of drug-like molecules, which are being already uh, tested for all cytotoxicity, toxicity, ADME, and the all uh, pharmacokinetics. Yeah. But those drugs are already there for malaria. Mm. And the, some of the targets are known. For example, that one of the target is the cysteine protease, yes. right? The cysteine protease is there in malaria parasite, but the same cysteine protease that is M M MCL pro present in uh, the coronavirus 2. And this protease, M MCL pro present in coronavirus, is also uh, belong to the family of cysteine protease. It, uh, it also um, is involved in the uh, proliferation of the virus. So I would like to see my anti-malarial compound whether that is also blocking the cysteine protease and finally blocking the replication of a virus. And that's what I have already uh, collaborated to, to, um, to one of the um, NIV scientists to look whether my compound, which is a cysteine protease inhibitor, drug-like molecule, already there, they, uh, whether it will block the, uh, the replication of a virus by targeting the cysteine protease or not. Oh, yeah. nice. Okay. Looking forward to the outcome. <laughs> yeah, and the cysteine protease also like you can always make, right? Uh, because in my lab, we have already published four or five papers. So okay. we have made the cysteine protease of malaria parasites. So it will work as a counter screen for me, you know, because Absolutely. there are different uh, proteases. Already. But if I can make... form can be tested even in my lab, whether it will block the cysteine protease of COVID, yeah. uh, meaning coronavirus. Wonderful. Yes. Going to the next question, how could we correlate in silico predictions to decisions on wet lab experiments and vice versa on rationalization? 
Yeah. <clears throat> so I think uh, the correlation uh, you will see like many publication is really uh, not that good. Many yeah, correlation good. from in silico prediction uh, with the wet lab is like established that correlation is really uh, not uh, sufficient, but it can give you some clue to be very frank. For example, mm -hmm. you cannot just uh, think of millions of compound screening whatever high throughput assays you are running, but screening against uh, uh, in your wet lab experiment. However, if you have a real uh, good bioinformatics support within silico prediction, at least you can short out some of them. But of course, there is a chance that uh, you will miss out also. But uh, some way, I think uh, correlation cannot be established in a very strong way, but they are complementary to each other. I strongly agree and I like the presentation what you gave uh, spoke about the chirality and different conformers uh, also the R and S uh, uh, mixtures of course uh, uh, we have to when you're doing in silico prediction we have to consider this because on uh, real uh, wet lab experiments these uh, different conformers makes a big difference as you rightly mentioned on toxicity and other uh, para physiochemical parameters yes yes yeah okay uh what are all the characteristics that you would look for to know whether a protein is druggable in a structural sense <clears throat> yes so druggability of a protein again is a big question because you have identified the protein but maybe uh it is it, it cannot be druggable and mm -hmm. why i say so if, like a structural sense meaning it cannot give you a surface maybe it cannot give an interface where you are really going to dock to something so it's more of the question uh, for the uh, the more bioinformatization and other way but i think uh, it's so valid one meaning um, but i would not like to deviate myself just uh, uh, excluding the compounds which my chemist uh, which my bioinformatician is saying that your protein is not druggable mm. because maybe it is not directly druggable but it is druggable through the interaction way because i am dealing with a very complex system that is biology so yeah. the protein itself not in one go is in action it is in action in a uh, in a complex way with the interaction with multiple proteins so uh, to conclude this, if this is not druggable, I will hesitate a bit. But yes, as per se, in a single one-to-one, uh, -one, it might not be druggable. But in a, com uh, in a uh, complex or in an interaction basis, it will always be druggable. That's my, uh, I think okay. so. See, uh, I think this question came up maybe because of this uh, context. For example, uh, when we picked up a protein for doing docking analysis yeah. and tomorrow yeah. you're going to do any in vitro or in vivo analysis, yeah. how yes. confident are we the same yeah. protein that we have chosen yeah. for in silico studies are the same one that we are targeting? Very true. And that's what I gave one example where I'm targeting, I'm dragging my CDPK1, not only by one to one, but it is interaction to 1433. Mm, okay. okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and so your druggability will also enhance for X compound when let's say uh, maybe in a particular conformation, mm -hmm. my uh, my uh, protein is not druggable, but mm -hmm. upon interaction to any other protein, it is somehow giving a surface for uh, for the druggability. Don't you think so, Giri? True, true, true. Uh, yeah. Mm, that, that, that's what that's where my another question comes in because most of your studies you have uh, shown about docking but uh, have you carried out uh, molecular dynamics anywhere yes so i wanted to show to show that uh, um, one of the movies uh, the md simulation we have done okay. so uh, of course that uh, we do uh, meaning again my collaborators for me okay sure sure and uh, does that have some uh, uh, correlation with your uh, findings? Yes, sure. Okay, that, great. Uh, so the correlation enhances with that. Yeah, sure. Okay. And, uh, yeah. and if you have the knowledge, I mean, information, uh, could you please let me know how much nanoseconds uh, the molecular dynamics was carried? More than, uh, I think, the 10, 30 nanoseconds that way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. 
so kind of a refinement studies i think you could yeah, have done yeah, okay yeah. okay great great thank you so much uh, yeah. what kind of interaction between the potential target to effector is most favorable if we are planning to drug it i didn't understand what is drug it anyway yeah so what kind of a interaction between the potential target to effector is most favorable mm -hmm. yeah. if you yeah. okay mm -hmm. Okay, so it is a, like some kind of this question is really a very thoughtful. I should take it. Like, okay. uh, for example, I I want to target X protein, right? Mm -hmm. But the just the targeting is important, or targeting to its destination is important. You mm -hmm. have to think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there, if if I'm uh, I'm more targetable. When I am there in the destination, and you could target it, so there the interaction between becomes more important. For right. example, if in a uh, in a cell membrane, the protein is there because it's always a dynamic, right? It's yeah. coming from the cytosol due to some post-translational mod modification, and it's trafficking up uh, up and down. Yeah. But its functions are more defined. To the to the membrane because when it is in the cytosol its function is not there it's not interacting to any protein yeah. so in that case the interaction becomes really uh, important so nowadays if you you have you must have read the very very latest uh, publication so mm. what we do we don't kill the protein we kill it kill its interaction so we bring down the protein from the destination to the whatever cytosol we would like to and okay. we just Keep it more non-functional because it's not there at the de destination, and that is also one of the drugable approach. Because uh, when the uh, compound is binding to the protein and not allowing to go to the target area. Okay, clear. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, but in this context, I have another question. Uh, so earlier you had a work that you were being working on, uh, 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 where you have to block some part, but uh, not uh, sorry, one target and not the other target. So I yes. was thinking, uh, um, did you do any computational uh, like uh, uh, rationalization there to prove that, or just wet lab experiment? Wet lab, because generally, you no, know, this membrane encourage and all these are more on the signaling mediated, like exactly. a lipid moiety attachment and the interaction with the post translational modification. So I don't think the in silico gives you that much support for yeah. prediction of those. Because still we are really uh, meaning somehow I I don't have those kind of a co collaborators which can really predict meaning this kind of a, so yeah uh, I okay. don't have that kind of a... clear uh, next question uh, what are the experiments carried out in drug repositioning multiple targets might be a challenge mm -hmm. so, so you know. <clears throat> meaning uh, uh, Generally, the experiments for drug repositioning is, uh, as I said, the target based. So the high throughput screening being done. Like, for example, if you see the last one month, there are more than 100 papers for COVID yeah. drug repositioning. So you just name a protein. People are uh, first doing the virtual, the in silico screening, which is again trying to take the FDA approved drugs, the library of FDA approved drugs or malarial drugs trying to rep, uh, reposition. But the experiment, if you say that, of course, the wet lab experiment would be the function of that protein. Like, as I said, uh, I'm I'm concentrating on a protease. So the uh, virus protease I am going to make in the lab. I'm going to design an assay. So this will be a fluorescent assay, fluorescence-based assay. So uh, there will be a peptide. Peptide will be having a, the motive, which is being recognized by the virus protease. And it will cut. Once it will cut, there will be a the disruption of the the fret uh, fret pairing, and mm -hmm. then that way there will be a signal. So that kind of enzyme assay we have already designed for a particular protease, and then high throughput. So these are the experiments. So once we will test that the protease are being blocked, then the whether it is also blocking the virus. So okay. you, we are going to go for the virus. So it's the same. Like, okay. And multiple targets might be a challenge, of course, because as I said, it's just not one protease. There are a family of proteases present. So yeah. uh, then we have to make at least two or three proteases that the counter screen, meaning ah. counter human protease, which should not be blocked. 
showed that way. <clears throat> okay, so kind of selectivity is also being carried yeah. out. Yes. But these are the experiment you do. Yeah. Okay, clear. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, I am a master student in biotech. Uh, what is our field's uh, role in drug repurpose? So as a biotechnology. Yeah. Yes, very nice. So you know, biotechnology has a real. Uh, I think uh, has got the key for drug repurpose. Okay. As I said, to prove to prove its target, the tools are only there with the biotech. One or two tools, I say there is a chemical tool. There is, a, but. Biotech only like if I would like to over express a particular gene to prove that my compound is targeting that particular uh, protein which I want to repurpose. Of course, you are going to use the biotechnology tool, you are going to clone the gene, you are going to episomally over express. If I would like to say no, 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 you have to prove by deleting a gene from where the tool is coming from the biotech, the tool is coming. You delete the gene and show now the compound is not doing anything. So you are really repurposing in a target-based way. So, right. so many things, so many things. By so by this, oh, oh yeah. sorry. Uh, by this answer, I can understand if a person is planning to do, or a group is planning to do drug repurposing, he should yes. have biotechnologist, he should have um, a chemist who knows synthesis, <laughs> he should have a computational chemist, he should have uh, pharmacologists who also understand about pharmacokinetics and dynamics. I think it's a consortium that they should form when they wanted to do drug sure. repurposing. Sure, okay. and then maybe the proper discussion how to go about mm. with a very case-to-case -case basis. You're right. That would be the real way of uh, going forward. So yes. ultimately, take home message from this answer is: if you're working on drug discovery, uh, it should be collaboration, cooperation, and multidisciplinary people who have to come on board on a single table. Yes, only we do need a multiple courses which are more mostly focused on this kind of a question. Like exactly. um, maybe ten days of fifteen days. Uh, so I have designed a course on drug okay. discovery, uh, touching okay. all the aspect. So uh, okay. which is really going to tell us uh, how? Yeah. Okay. So someone should come uh, go down to JNU to attend her course. Anyway, I recommend. Yeah, so the students. Be a part of a Gyan course. So okay. once I get the green signal from the university, I am going to float it. Oh, so nice. it's like a non-paid course, so anybody oh. can join. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So please let me know so that I can share with all the uh, students and scholars who are in touch with me. It will be really useful sure. for them. Yeah. Yeah. Going to the next question. Uh, let's say we have both target and decide drug. Uh, which approach is promising, ligand or target based? So let's say we have both targets and desired drug. Which approach is promising, ligand or target based? Probably based on your slides where we where you have mentioned target based repurposing and others. Yeah. So I prefer mostly the target based, uh, mm -hmm. though uh, I, I told you the success is more for the phenotypic because. You can really screen uh, maybe some herbal drug, menstrual compounds. Mm -hmm. Do, don't even know the target, but at least you can have anti anti pathogen, anti cancer impact. But yeah. with going through the target as a molecular and cellular biologist, I think uh, the target based approach is more targeted, and uh, the chances of uh, uh, the stringency and the chances of uh, very focused. Uh, uh, and non uh, more specific uh, uh, drug discovery is possible only with the target based. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the challenges you faced while working on infectious disease drug discovery? Yeah. So it's like a real uh, <clears throat> challenges are more on the pathogen side because mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm lucky enough that I can grow the malaria parasite in dishes. So I can at least screen and I can understand the biology of malaria parasite by growing in a cultured dish. But uh, just think about some of the disease, infectious uh, pathogens, which even we are struggling that we cannot grow. And for that, like I would like to quote uh, a malaria parasite, Vivex. So we, we get malaria by generally by five pathogens. There are five uh, Plasmodium species, which causes human malaria, malaria, uh, Plasmodium falciparum, Vivex, Nolzai, malaria, and ovale. 
so these five ones are uh, so we can only culture the falciparum vivex cannot be cultured mm. so for example it's a uh, the the uh, different variant plasmodium but if i want to really test the drug i don't have the culture system okay so these are the challenges and i think whoever will make a culture system for vivex is going to really help the community a lot and there are there was a bill gates uh, melinda fund supported research for vivex culture but still there is no success got it got it yeah so these are the challenges really while working because if don't have the essay how come i can, you can i can uh, madam when you are working on plasmodium falciparum so are you working on specific strains like p53 or something others so like a uh, falciparum uh, uh, like we have multiple strain like a field of strains uh, okay. which is been collected from uh, cambodia which is also been uh, collected from orissa from uh, uh, the northeast area so okay. we have already characterized those uh, field isolates which are uh, more on the india specific and asia specific and uh, we have also uh, made uh, through crispr uh, cas system mm -hmm. some resistance uh, line of malaria parasite to test so that is also there so okay. it's a, like a panel yeah uh, given that sophisticated molecular tools are available why we have uh, why we are unable to identify molecular target for artemisin Yes, so it's a real relevant question. Whoever is this uh, fellow, I I think um, he's really a good thinking uh, capability. Mm -hmm. So as I said, uh, any compound it has a different mode of action. Yeah. So if the compound mode of action is more on radical formation, right? Mm -hmm. So if it is more radical formation, then the target would cannot be one. because it is just attacking the structure of the protein or structure of the dna so it is damaging the protein damaging the dna whatever is there in the vicinity so the dynamicity of a cell will determine that time when you are putting the artemisinin artemisinin is making a free radicals because if you look at the mechanism how the artemisinin is is killing a cell because it it creates the uh, the radical formation it induces the radical formation and that radical is uh, not a target specific so how will you tar uh, identify the target you will just identify these are the proteins got damaged due to that okay 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 what are the challenges in drug discovery for discovering the drug for covid 19 Mm -hmm. so the yes uh, sure uh, i think uh, the challenge is uh, that first let me talk to uh, let me tell you the the positive thing positive thing is that we know the genome mm. positive thing is that we know the orf positive thing is that we have all the information from uh, coronavirus 1 sars coronavirus 1 so and the genome is quite similar yep. uh, so we know that so the information is there for, to handle but at the challenges if i say that uh, because it's so virulent the the culturing so already that nih uh, has got the uh, the culture uh, adopted for the uh, lung epithelial cells so the virus is there which uh, go and infect to the uh, that has been adopted for the infection to the uh, lungs uh, lungs epithelial cells so that culture is now being used but handling that culture because of its virulency and because of the demand of bsl3 those are the challenges but uh, at this okay so in jania jania do you have a bsl2 or bsl3 facility uh hello uh, madam can you hear us uh okay we'll wait for a second i think some network issue limitation in the discovery uh, problem yeah okay uh, we, in between we missed your audio yeah uh, but now you're back um uh, i want to say the challenges is more for the virus culture uh okay. because uh, we, as i told that uh, nih has already got the virus from okay. cdc but national institute of health us has got from cdc and that virus is adopted 
for infection to lung epithelial cell. In our India, NIV, National Institute of Virology, has also got the, uh, the isolated the virus from the patient. And that virus, they are adopting to infect to the human uh, lung epithelial cells. Once it's been done, I think we will also be able to test some of our compounds in virus. Oh, against great. Yeah. great. Uh, but just for curiosity, at JNU, do you have BCL2 or BCL3 facility? Yes. So uh, oh. BCL3 facility uh, we have in JNU, and uh, it was with the School of Biotechnology. And okay. now I think uh, they are also making it uh, for the the maybe COVID uh, research. Okay, great. Uh, what does KEL do with respect to parasite? Okay, so the KEL, uh, KEL is uh, a receptor, a blood group antigen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, um, generally receptor, we always think about that uh, maybe it is interacting to the ligand, that there should be some parasite ligand which is interacting. But in, in a particular KEL, it's an endopeptidase. So uh, you can just imagine your red cell has one endopeptidase which is a blood group antigen also present on the surface. So the kel is somehow trying to uh, 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 clean up the uh, parasite protein. So if just imagine there is a parasite and here is the red cell. So parasite is trying to attach to red cell and invade. So for the attachment, it requires only few proteins. But if our, there are multiple proteins, you need to shed it off. So the shedding process, meaning the shaving process is quite important for parasite to enter and this saving process uh, the saving process or the uh, the shedding process being mediated by kel that's what my prediction is we are trying to prove it okay wait how do i know which library of drugs should be useful for most promising of action i mean uh, what is the basis of choice i think you have already mentioned that different collaborators are concentrating on different uh, types of chemistries so I think uh, based on that, uh, the participant is asking, I think so. Yes, so the uh, library of drugs, again, uh, library of drugs, you should be knowing according to your target. Like for example, if your target is a kinase, go for the kinase library. If you know your uh, uh, target is a protease, why will you, first you should be uh, asking for the protease inhibitor libraries. But at the same time, if you are really, uh, there is always a drug-like library because you uh, medicinal chemistry is going to tell you that this library is like a drug like meaning it has other uh, there could be there is no uh, solubility issue there is no um, uh, meaning it is water soluble maybe it is more stable so yeah. those kind of a library one should be uh, asking for depending upon your research yes yeah uh, madam uh, uh, for your research uh, uh, when you carried out have you ever thought about uh, the metabolites of the drug molecules that you screened okay. yes so and very important because uh, you know uh, just for the audience also the question is like uh, generally we take always the pro drug yeah. uh, and for repurposing you have to be very careful because sometimes uh, we are totally in 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 some way that we are uh, thinking about the pro drug and we are we have not thought about the metabolite but generally the in action your metabolites are the one which are going to target your uh, uh, parasite or pathogen or your in uh, cancer cell so yeah. in that case uh, but at the same time your your culture system where you are testing your uh, compound, if they are not making that metabolite, so you are misguided totally. Ah, okay, got it clear. Okay. Right. For okay. example, uh, let, let's say uh, I don't have those ends of no use because it, it is going to be a different metabolite inside the. That's what we have a, a mouse model also, but again the metabolism of human and metabolism of mouse doesn't match. So mm. you have to really screen. The metabolite as well as the uh, the pro drug. Yeah, very nice question. Yes. That also takes to an another uh, uh, confusion here. Let's say we are not working on drug repurposing, but we are working on something uh, synthesized molecules by some chemist. Now, mm -hmm. uh, and you have to do metabolite. So, based on docking uh, studies or some screening yeah. studies, you come to a conclusion to uh, have that compound tested in vitro, in vivo. Very so, true. what is the yeah. challenge there? <laughs> Yes, 
I, I I completely agree. Then in that case, uh, just go for uh, in silico uh, screening of your metabolites because getting yeah. the metabolites is too too difficult. And then you go for your in vivo screening. Interesting. Yeah. True. Yeah. True. True. So true. It's really uh, it's very interesting in that way because, because I got yeah. hooked up uh, with one of the compounds, so I am the. I had the real pain in that way. Okay. So yeah, because uh, our pro drug, uh, we were so excited. We found a very nice anti-malarial action, okay. but uh, I didn't realize when we are going to put it to the mouse, it is going to really convert it to the metabolite. And that was not uh, even anti-malarial for us. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's so, true. Uh, but that's it was yeah. Then I use that knowledge, you know, I yeah. use that knowledge and now I have turned that product to the drug. Meaning ah. that that particular bond which was uh, getting metabolized, Unstable. I have just attached uh, it to something else. Got because it. so much of research, I, I cannot just uh, leave it here. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, that is what we have to understand because there are a lot of papers published just on docking and then in vitro assays. That's it. But uh, nobody discusses, uh, very few uh, community discusses about the pro drug strategy and other factors. Great. Uh, okay. Yes, I'm, yes, true. I'm Dr. M. Mahima. What is the mechanism and mode of action of chloroquine towards uh, COVID-19? Uh, if you have an answer for this. Yes, yes. <clears throat> you know, uh, this chlor chloroquine, uh, for more people are saying that uh, even we know, like mm -hmm. uh, COVID, uh, this chloroquine is some kind of a autophagy yeah. inducer kind. Huh? So, like, uh, why it is anti-malarial? Because also uh, it targets to the food vacuole of malaria parasite. The similar way uh, in human, why it is anti-COVID? Because again, it is like chloroquine is also used as a positive control for inducing autophagy. And seeing that the autophagosomes are not coupling to the main uh, um, autophagy vesicles, so okay. according to me, uh, it is more on the immunomodulatory way. The chloroquine is working because again, uh, the target cells which are affected through the, uh, which are infected by the virus, mm -hmm. they have to undergo either the apoptosis or uh, killing mechanism to suppress uh, the growth. And there, uh, this chloroquine is working to that mechanism. Okay. okay. So just read about more on the autophagy and uh, inducing aspect of this chloroquine. Chloroquine, okay. Uh, we have two more questions. That is, uh, how do you determine and correlate it, it with the immunomodulation impact? How the B cells, T cells, and how the T cells are uh, really being regulated through the autophagic process? Their action, how they it's re regulated through that, and how that will affect the infection. So it would be really interesting to uh, to understand all those. Yeah. Great, great. How do you determine or design the experiments that you have done? to come up with the answers to your hypothesis or queries? Mm -hmm. So uh, my, <clears throat> uh, my approach is uh, first you should prove you wrong. Meaning you, uh, your experiments should be designed such a way that your, uh, you should prove that your hypothesis is wrong. Mm. That will give you the maximum result. Very Let's right. say, I can, uh, any research, any research should be driven in that way that if I say that this protein is involved in replication, to prove that is not a fun. But to prove that it is not, meaning in a, a other way that, okay, this protein is somehow not involved in the replication, I will come up with a multiple experimental design. And finally, I will fail my own experiment to prove that it is a replication factor. You're right. You're right. And that should the research should drive. Because just proving this, then we become blind. We You're just right. become too biased, saying that this does this, so just prove this way. Design your experiment to prove in a positive way. No, research doesn't go like this. Yeah, yeah. very true, very true. Uh, this is the same thing which I do when I uh, we go for this virtual screening. So yes. uh, on a parameterization, we tell them, we are not doing in silico studies to choose best compounds. We yes. are doing in silico uh, studies to remove non-promising compounds. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, rightly said. Great. Yes. Uh, Very nice. Yeah. Is there any wet lab based drug design courses <clears throat> resources to understand how to carry out experiment again? I think uh, you already mentioned.
think uh, there are some courses right now being launched by uh, Harvard. Uh, I think just during the COVID uh, time, and okay. there are three courses on drug uh, drug design. Okay. Right. So Howard, uh, the, generally they offer uh, this time they are offer it, it's for free. One yes, should read this. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Great. So we are done with all the questions. Uh, so <laughs> thank you so much for the energy and your patience because we have. Uh, it is almost going to be uh, six o'clock. Uh, it's almost like two hours. Uh, no, we I had, uh, I'm <laughs> sorry. Sometime uh, my computer and everything was. Uh, no problem. We are everything. We were on time, so no problems at all. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all the thank participants. This opportunity, I really would like to thank you from. As, uh, like it is a real good opportunity for me, and I would also like to mention Professor Dar. He's yes. my collaborator and also my friend. So it's a really a good opportunity. He introduced me to you, and uh, you gave, gave me the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Pavan, sir, for this. This is really a, a need of the hour uh, talk because um, modelers concentrate only on in silico aspects, a little bit knowledge about the testing and the inhibit inhibition. Uh, the chemist will always focus on increasing the yield, uh, better, um, uh, less number of reactions, and biologists always focus on the other. But this presentation gave a, a combination how we can collaborate each and where to place each of the area and their expertise to come out with a promising uh, drug-like or drug molecule. So really wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And we are looking forward to uh, your more uh, uh, research outcomes and also in future uh, some other uh, talk on a different uh, topic. Uh, thank you so much for the day. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Uh, so we have a tomorrow uh, a session, uh, live demo session on modeler, which is completely for uh, protein homology modeling. Uh, okay. It will be a two hour session. So our usual sessions are happening on Saturdays and uh, Sundays. Saturdays, we have invited expert talk at 4 p.m. and Sundays.